Hello and welcome to Study IQ English, your one stop destination for success in the UPSC Civil Services exam. A very warm welcome to today's current affairs short video where let's talk about climate change but with a different perspective. Now, right today, that 8th of August, there was an elaborate article in the Hindu newspaper which spoke about how today even organizations like the International Court of Justice have started commenting on how carelessly the developed and the developing countries both have been taking their climate mitigation agenda. The court was so disappointed that, in fact, it gave the choice to various countries by asking them to be flexible about their carbon footprint limit, which is known as nationally determined contribution. The court said, choose your NDC wisely. Do it only as much as you can achieve. But at the end, it is important to show that you are serious about bringing a remarkable reduction in your carbon emission. In that light, a very interesting concept emerges. The concept is that of carbon emission trading. While we all know that carbon emission, greenhouse gases emission are the prime reasons for air pollution, global warming, ecological degradation. But I'm sure you must have heard of the very old phrase called pass the buck, where instead of taking the responsibility of a problem, it's easy to pass the responsibility to somebody else. Something similar is happening even in the climate discourse in today's world. When we talk about carbon emission trading, the word trade corresponds to some kind of exchange economic or non-economic. It's about shifting your possessions, exchanging your goods and commodities and services with somebody else. Can something as serious as climate mitigation be treated like a trade or an exchange system is the question we ask here. Now, carbon emission trading is also sometimes referred to as cap and trade system. It can be known as Emission Trading Scheme ETS as well. It is basically an agreement between countries where some countries would reduce their carbon emission and in return, they get to sell the rights to do emission to another country which really has a larger carbon footprint. It is like passing the responsibility of climate control from the hands of the poorer, lesser developed countries into the hands of the more industrialized and richer countries. Is it justified? Carbon emission trading has been created typically on paper to solve and combat the problem of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, which ultimately are enveloping our planet at a faster rate today. The whole purpose is to allow countries to trade between themselves the right to emit, the right to create a carbon footprint. It becomes a mechanism for reducing the carbon emission by telling some countries that stop your carbon emission. In return, you get money. You get to sell the rights to emit to some other country who has the capacity to pay for it. On paper, the logic is that when the countries will have to pay for emitting more carbon, they may choose not to emit so much. They may have a tougher control on their emission rate. But history and the data speaks otherwise. Unfortunately, even today, there are certain underdeveloped least industrialized countries which do not have a high carbon footprint and yet they are further reducing their carbon footprint only to earn more money by exchanging these rights, by giving these carbon emission tickets to another rich country like for example the US and the countries of the EU which have continued to hold a very very high carbon footprint 
since history, specifically since the 1990s. Now, having said that, countries who are exceeding their targets, who are exceeding their emission targets, absolutely find it easy to buy more credits, more rights to do emission from the poorer countries, whose emission is much below their targets. Is it not something that is very closely related to economic rather ecological imperialism we may have heard about social cultural financial imperialism political imperialism but yes this corresponds to the newer ecological imperialism where the richer countries will automatically have more power to purchase emission drives the key objective of the whole scheme initially when it was created, was to make sure that an upper limit is put, an upper cap is put on various emissions done by companies, factories, industries the world over. So that overall, the global carbon emission rates come down. But the system was supposed to create a kind of desire among countries, a desire among companies and corporations that if you reduce your carbon footprint, you get money for that. You will not have to buy extra credits. So ultimately, it's your profit. So it was thought to be a very clever step of financially attracting, luring companies and countries to automatically be forced to reduce their emissions. But then, has it happened in reality? Well, not really, because the richer industrialized nations never felt that financial need to sell their excess credits and get money because they could never have excess credits. Excess credits could only be achieved by the lesser industrialized nations. It was a need for them, not the need for the richer industrial countries anyway. So the diagram here on your screen talks volumes about the carbon emission system. That excessive greenhouse gas emission now leads to you purchasing more and more credit and the lesser you secrete the more rights you will have to sell these credits and get money in return so it was supposed to be a very commercially based exchange system for climate betterment in the long run a very good question can be when did this system even begin globally so it was back in the 1992 when in south america the famous rio de janeiro summit took place more than about 160 countries here agreed to the convention of UNFCCC, that's the United Nations Convention on Climate Change, to adopt this system. It only became stronger in 1997 as the Kyoto Protocol became the first major agreement to strictly control greenhouse gas emission. Further, about 38 developed countries agreed and committed to achieving stricter targets of carbon and greenhouse gas control. And they also agreed to the system of carbon exchange rating system. Now, carbon emissions trading as a proper, as a very common act began back in 2021 with China's national carbon trading scheme. Since then, it has definitely picked up pace and many more countries seem to be interested here. But the question still remains the same. Will passing the buck from one nation to another eventually ever help in curtailing climate degradation? Will it ever help in protecting the climate or no? So that's a dilemma we are left with. Now, talking about how this scheme happens to be very, very commercial. It is based on a marketplace. It's a market process, okay? Because the buying and selling of carbon credits, your carbon credits could be points. These could be rights. You can also call them as license. The license to emit more and more pollution. The license to have a larger carbon footprint. Now, this, therefore, is a market for trading carbon license, carbon emission license. It, therefore, is a very good economic incentive for those companies who can stop their carbon emission, who can create more green, renewable and sustainable technologies in order to bring down their emission rate. That is the only positive aspect of the whole scheme, that in case 
private companies, multinationals, and other organizations get incentivized to save their carbon credits, to save money in the long run, then perhaps they will be more attracted. They will be more interested to use better, cleaner sources of energy for production and manufacturing. But apart from that, when the countries start abusing the system, when the country is treated like an absolute marketplace, which has nothing to do with larger climate control responsibility, that's when the system looks very lopsided. So then what are the carbon markets? How will we define them? It's a very predominant topic for GS Paper 3 UPSC mains talking about carbon emission, greenhouse gases, climate mitigation and adaptation. So here is the Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. It was in the news today as well. This provides for the use of international carbon markets for various countries who are trying to achieve their nationally determined contributions, which means the targets that these countries have created to control their total level of pollution. Carbon markets are nothing but just a way of putting some kind of price. You can also say it is like a fine. It is like a tax that you have to pay for your carbon emission. The lesser you emit, the more units, the more credits are in your pocket. The more you emit, you will have to buy extra and spend money for that. So it is almost like a tradable permit. Now, the only sad thing about the whole process is like ultimately, by creating a market mechanism, somewhere we are also saying that we are giving certain countries and companies some kind of a permission of doing carbon footprint only if they can afford to do. But linking environmental responsibility completely to financial status sometimes leads to the abuse of the whole purpose of the scheme in the first place. Now, for example, carbon allowance, carbon caps are decided, created by countries and the governments according to their carbon emission targets, rates, existing mechanisms. And now, ultimately, therefore, we are still left with the same dilemma. Will the scheme incentivize private players and governments alike to stop climate degradation, to control their carbon footprint? Or will it just get lost in the whole marketplace debate where the poorer countries will continue to stop themselves but the richer countries will continue to use the benefit of permission, keep buying the system, keep buying the credits and continue happily with their current emission rate. So talking about India, now India is one country that is strongly committed to its nationally determined contributions. There are various goals and the Indian government of late has also been giving too much importance to solar energy. You may have heard about schemes like the PM Kusum scheme, where even the government has now decided to provide with farmers in the villages solar energy-based irrigation pumps to irrigate their field. And so many rooftop installations are already in place. Apart from that, the government is very committed to driving towards an economy that's dominated by natural gas. We also talk about ethanol mixed with petrol. Now, all these things eventually just highlight Indian government's commitment for reducing its carbon footprint. 2030 is the year where we have decided to really cut down our emissions by more than 30% right now. In fact, recently, we have increased our commitment and made it to 45% reduction by 2030 as compared to 2005 levels. Now, 50% of installed electric power capacity in India will come from non-fossil fuels, which means clean, green, non conventional renewable energy. That's the target India has made for 2030. The goal three itself highlights that. Now it says reduce the intensity, the rate of emission by 33% and 35% by 2030 by the 2000 as compared to the 2000 level. So a 45% reduction is what we are aiming at. It's a very ambitious plan. Let's see how it goes. And in the meantime, if it is accomplished. It will be a major step towards protecting ecology, not just for our national interest, but also for overall global benefit.
And on that note, I take your leave with this video. Do like, share and subscribe if you find the video useful. Thank you so much.